Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the panel, um, AI and Machine Learning and Cancer Medicine. Uh, my name is Mark Hurlbert. I'm the Chief Science Officer at the Melanoma Research Alliance. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, the Melanoma Research Alliance, just a quick background for those of you that don't know, is a unique organization, was founded in 2007 by Deborah and Leon Black, and we're um, under the auspices of the Milken Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, MRA uh, finds and funds the most promising research worldwide to defeat this deadly skin cancer. Uh, melanoma is one of the few cancers whose incidence is still rising around the globe and kills more than 10,000 people around the globe each year. Um, MRA has funded in our first decade or so $110 million in melanoma research, leveraged another 140 to 150 million, and has invested in more than 300 projects across the US and 15 countries. Uh, AI and machine learning is a part of that uh, topic. Uh, we've invested uh, working on helping dermatologists uh, better detect melanoma, um, working with pathologists to better define the stage of diagnosis, and it's a key topic across cancer. And so today we've assembled a really outstanding panel to address the topic of AI and machine learning in, in cancer more broadly. And uh, no pressure on the panel, but this morning I heard uh, Mike Milken, uh, Francis Collins, and Seema Verma all on the morning panel uh, raise the topic of AI. And so no pressure, <laughs> but I think it's going to be a, a really interesting topic. So uh, first, let me introduce the panelists. Um, their full bios are in the program or in the Milken Institute app. Um, you can look at them. But on my right is uh, Dr. Maurice Ferre, CEO and chairman of the board of Inside Tech, advancing focus ultrasound. Uh, next to him here is Colin Hill, uh, chairman, CEO, and co-founder of GNS Healthcare. Um, on my left, we have Mike Nohaley, who is Senior Vice President of Strategy, Commercialization, and Innovation at Amgen. And finally, uh, Dr. Susan Sweater, who is Professor of Dermatology and Director of the Pigmented Lesion Program at Stanford University Medical Center. So we'll get right into the questions. And uh, Susan, I think we'll start with you. So you've had some pretty exciting headline-generating uh, research in the field of AI uh, with uh, neural networks and uh, deep learning that... Uh, the computers are actually doing as well as, or maybe better than dermatologists. So do you want to tell us, tell us about your research and where we're at? Sure, thank you, Mark, and it's a pleasure to be here. So I've been in the field of melanoma for 25 years and have seen in the last decade, as we all have this incredible progress in advanced disease therapy with checkpoint inhibition and targeted therapy for mutant tumors with the BRAF mutation. Where we haven't made the same progress, though, is in prevention and particularly early detection of this disease. And just so the audience understands the difference in survival or the risk for metastasis in tumors that are a millimeter is, is significantly different than that in tumors that are just a slightly bit deeper at four millimeters. That's several hairbreadths thicker. So when we talk about early detection, we want to visually inspect the skin and, and find this lesion earlier. Based on some of the preliminary work that's been done with the Google Inception 3 and ImageNet uh, algorithms and the success in image classification, we worked with Sebastian Thrun's group at Stanford AI and Computer Science and our dermatology team to really construct a deep learning algorithm for dermatology classifications focusing on detection of the most common epithelial filial malignancies. Those are the keratinocyte cancers, basal cell and squamous cell, which tend not to be fatal. And then of course, differentiation of melanoma, the most fatal human cancer, fatal, sorry, skin cancer, compared to benign nevi. We utilized a, a training set of 139,000 uh, curated images from around the world, including dermoscopic images, which gives us a look at the skin surface uh, microscopy for pigmented lesions. And we trained the system over a few weeks. And as Mark alluded to, when we tested it against 21 board certified dermatologists at Stanford, Penn, Harvard, and Iowa, including myself, it did as well as or better than some of the dermatologists. And that was a bit of a surprise and something that we thought well, what we've really shown is that, the, that it can do well at image classification of static photographic images. We did not intend this proof of principle, though, to be a deliverable to the consumer or even to the health provider at that point. The system requires prospective clinical validation in a real-world setting and not in silico, which is how we had tested it. Since our publication, there have been about eight other convolutional neural networks that have shown, again, great diagnostic ability in comparison to expert dermatologists, dermatopathologists in pigmented skin lesion or basal cell, squamous cell diagnosis, even toenail fungus, though one could argue about the merits of that uh, as an AI uh, progress. 
But um, we um, really want to emphasize that this needs several things. We need to break down the black box of AI and understand why the machine uh, creates an output of, of benign or malignant or a probability score. We need to test this among various skin types and ensure that there isn't inequity in AI in the way we train and test and validate and use this in the public sector. And then finally, we need to be proactive with legislation and regulation of AI to bring it to the forefront for the consumer-facing app and for apps that help the practitioner, both the specialist and the primary care provider. Great. Thanks, Susan. So uh, helps in the early detection, diagnosis of cancer potentially. So once, once we know a patient has cancer, uh, Colin, I'll turn over to you, but you've done some really deep, uh, different omics uh, learning combining it with clinical features of a patient's diagnosis. Do you want to describe how we're using it in that setting? Sure. Um, so I think the field has crossed a threshold where there's sufficiently rich and dense data and sufficiently powerful types of machine learning and AI. And I'm sure we'll talk about what the different kinds are because it's not, it's not all the same. But we have used combinations of multi-omic and clinical data and a particular type of technology around causal modeling, causal AI and simulation to reverse engineer in silico cancer patients and specifically in the area of multiple myeloma. So this is different than deep learning approaches that came out of Silicon Valley in the world of online advertising, which are useful in image analysis, as you just heard. This is going after really a bigger more important problem, which is treatment effectiveness. How can we now tell what interventions are going to work for which patients ahead of time? So, i.e., personalized medicine. So, in multiple myeloma, we've been working with various groups, including the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation and various pharma companies. And we took a large quantity of data from roughly 650 patients, reverse engineered in silico multiple myeloma patients, to now try to predict who's going to respond or not to stem cell transplant. It is invasive, painful, expensive at four to $500,000 a pop, 5% complication rate. So therefore, no patient really wants to get it unless it's going to work for them. So the question is, can you predict ahead of time? Turns out you can. And so we were able to now leverage this data, which had multiple levels of genomic and genetic data with longitudinal clinical outcomes to reverse engineer models that could be used to simulate how each patient is going to do respond or not respond to stem cell transplant, right, the what if question, and I was able to pull out now a marker, a subpopulation that ended up getting validated by a group at Dana-Farber, 20 months progression-free survival, depending on whether patients had a gene expression level that was beyond or below a given threshold. So that was, that's a rather recent um, application and I think the thing to take away from that is how quickly that happened. It was on the order of three months to do it. And the fact that it's extensible to other arenas. The researcher at our company who was doing this is neither an expert in stem cell transplant or multiple myeloma. And I think across a number of diseases, we're starting to get to that threshold where when matched with the right kind of technology, we can now get at this, this dream of precision medicine. Great, thanks. So, um... I think the theme of precision medicine and more personalized care is critical. Um, uh, Maurice, maybe I'll turn it over to you and how you're using uh, machine learning in uh, focused ultrasound and the technologies you're working with. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, so, we're in the we're in the device side of of the of the equation here. So, we're kind of at the at the stage of what what we can do uh, to do to do certain treatments and uh, our focus has been in the brain specifically and when we we look at our therapies in the brain the way our technology works is that we use acoustic energy ultrasound where we have a thousand beams of, of steerable electronics or ultrasound beams going into the skull and one of the first challenges that we have is 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 dealing with the deformation of those beams. So it's more of a physics problem in terms of how do you get ultrasound that usually gets absorbed uh, through the skull and, uh, and, and starts to scatter. And what we're trying to do is with submillimeter accuracy kind of bring all those beams together. Uh, so one of the things that we see that's important is to be able to kind of understand how to model uh, that type of data. And, and what we see is every skull has a different type of skull. 
and it, it requires different type of modelings. Um, and that allows us then to kind of steer the data. So we've used a lot of big data and AI to enable us to kind of steer, steer uh, these beams of electrical or optical um, acoustic energy in a very focused and targeted way. Um, once, once we get the, the beams uh, steered in that, in that area, the, the next big thing for us where we see big data and AI kind of coming in is understanding uh, what we're seeing in the brain. So we're, we're inside an MR machine. So um, a lot of things that, are, that our physicians are asking for is different types of modeling. So for example, tractography, when we're looking at, at different types of tracks in the brain and under, understanding that and kind of getting to that type of parameter is, is a kind of key element of our, our, our interest in terms of developing that, that technology. So, so these are the kind of key, key pieces that uh, we use and we're looking at um, to try to understand how, how we can use big data and AI in the brain. Great, thanks. So um, I think I'll turn over to you, Mike, um, from the pharmaceutical industry perspective. What, how do you make sense of all this big data and machine learning and where do you see it fitting into Amgen or, or more broadly drug development for cancer and other diseases? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's hard not to be excited about it. I think you have to take some time frame cuts and really think about it. Once you get out 10 plus years, it's hard to imagine a technology or a suite of technologies, because I think Colin's 100% right, there's a lot of different techniques here, um, that are gonna have more impact than artificial intelligence is poised to have. But right now what we have are a lot of technologies that can work um, under the right conditions with the exact right data, and do amazing things, which we heard about, um, but you still have to figure out exactly what those are. How do you fit them into a workflow? How do you make them meaningful? When do they you know, reach the level that they're deployable at scale across the healthcare system or inside a company or things like that? So we spend a lot of time on that. I will say one of the areas I'm most interested in, what gets uh, a lot of excitement in the press, which makes sense, are some of the machine vision kinds of applications that we've seen. Uh, we're personally very excited about some of the causal modeling uh, techniques that, that Colin mentioned, uh, simply because it answers a different kind of question, right? So if machine vision allows you to say, hey, can I do in less than a second what a human would also take a rapid amount of time? That's Andrew Ng's test for one of the founders of this field for you know where we are. Um, what Colin's talking about is something where it can help you predict the future, right? It can give you a counterfactual. If I did this intervention, I would get A. And if I did some other intervention, I would get B. And doing that in a much more sophisticated way than we've been able to do to this point. And of course, when you sit um, somewhere inside a company and looking out, you're constantly trying to figure out, well, what would happen if we did A or B? And of course, we all do that every day. So that's one of the areas that uh, I think is coming into focus as the data sets get bigger that are allowing us to do that. Great, well, let's turn a little bit to the to the different technologies. So um, <clears throat> we, you can talk amongst the panel, but so Susan, you talk a lot about really visual learning um, uh, processes, but maybe let's talk about some of the different techniques and different approaches to uh, machine learning. I don't know if Colin or Susan, you want to weigh in on how you're approaching it and where you see the field moving for uh, dermatology imaging. Well, I think you know people understand the difference between artificial intelligence, just simulating intelligent behavior, machine learning, where you're then training the system to learn on its own, usually through supervised learning with deep learning algorithms and convolutional neural networks, and then augmented intelligence, really, which is where we're headed, this intersection of machine learning and AI to enhance and work with human skills for that decision making. And just sort of thinking about you know the pain points we have in my specialty and these can be applicable to others where, again, there's uh, scarce specialties, needs, and so on, are looking at what the dermatologist specialist needs versus the primary care provider. Increasingly, we're seeing a workforce of nurse practitioners and physician assistants along with uh, physicians in the primary care realm, again, scarcer in uh, more scarce in rural areas than urban, and then where we can fit this into the patient care models. And, and Mark, I'm sure you're aware of this and others, but ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology just conducted a task force looking at cancer mortality in rural versus urban areas. And although we see the age-adjusted incidence of cancer lower in rural than urban areas, the mortality rates, the death rates are much higher across the board for cancers. And this is going to be related to increased poverty levels, time to get to the physician, and really, most importantly, lack of specialty care. So there's about one oncologist per 100,000 in rural areas compared to five per 100,000 
in urban areas. And we see the same problems with dermatologists, higher mortality, where there are fewer dermatologists per county nationwide. So when we talk about the pain points for the dermatologist, the, the AI and the machine learning algorithms could really help to sort and track lesions. And something we would have is an augmented second opinion, an automated second opinion on whether to follow or biopsy a lesion. For the primary care doc, we'd place the AI earlier in the, in the scheme of things. And primary care docs are, again, focused on more urgent comorbid conditions for the patient, less so on the skin. And so we have a, a cancer we can cure with early detection, which is done by visual inspection. Can we put this into the primary care workflow, make it efficient and effective? And then finally, for the patient, we could introduce AI into a number of schema, but really focusing on uh, suggestions and coaching to perform skin exams, um, how to do that, what to look for in terms of clinical warning signs, letting populations know that they are at risk. Many patients do not. We're seeing increasing burden of melanoma in darker skin individuals, including the large proportion of Hispanics we have in California. And then finally, really taking a look at change detection and lesions through serial photography. So again, just trying to address these, these pain points and where these different systems work um, according to who you are directing the, uh, the technology toward and then also um, what we can do in terms of the consumer. Yeah, no, I think really great points. I think, uh, Mike, before we were talking, it's not like we're ready to yet press a button and there you get your answer uh, for these things. Um, maybe making progress on visual... Uh, separating cancer from not cancer, benign from, but we're not yet there with la uh, natural language processing and, uh, sorry, natural language processing and other machine learning. Yeah, I mean, Where I think you, you can, we, I think you can divide the world, right? What clearly is working are convolutional neural networks for vision, right? And we even see cases here where perhaps they're going to be able to perform better than humans, either just more consistently or extract features that humans just simply can't see the pattern. Um, then natural language processing, I'm sure many of us have, you know, devices we interact by voice. They're far from perfect, but it's pretty impressive what they can do. They're certainly not yet at the grade where you could turn them loose on a patient and have them interact uh, unassisted in that case, but maybe they'll get there. And then there's all these suites of, you know, predictive technologies that allow you to predict what's going to happen into the future and allow you to make those decisions. But in every case, they still require a lot of thinking about how they're going to work, right? You can't just hand them to people and have them figure them out, right? That the technology's not going to do all the binding together. So I think we're still at a point of, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, bringing this to a primary care physician. My suspicion is it will be 20% figuring out the technology and 80%, well, 20% figuring out the technology, 20% figuring out how you want it to work in the workflow, then 60% getting people to actually work differently. Because it's very hard to get people to change, change what patterns. they're doing, mm -hmm. put it in. So again, there's a lot of great technology in the world, but how do you take that, be thoughtful about which piece you deploy where, and then do the change management, the really hard grinding work of setting up incentives and all the other stuff to get people to get the benefit. Yeah, well, and I think uh, along that continuum, getting it paid for, Getting it, Absolutely. In, getting it in guideline setting. So. Absolutely. If you ask people to use this in a way that's going to cost them money, they're not right. going to use it. Right. It's got to improve workflow, but there are, there are also concerns with that. If we improve the workflow with AI, are we then going to be asked to see more patients rather than enhance that doctor-patient relationship sure. and bring back the humanity in healthcare? Yeah, if, if it makes doctors go from record. 10 patients yeah in two hours to 30, 30 patients, not they're not gonna like right. go, well, this is great, I'm gonna totally use this. Well, well and just to counter also what you said, Mike, you know, most of the time that these AI algorithms have been taken into the clinical practice setting, they aren't more sensitive and specific than the human. And so we have a lot of problems again for sure. when we take it to the real world setting. Yeah. For sure. Well, uh, Eric Topol in his latest book, Deep Medicine, did say that it will, AI will help make uh, healthcare more human again. So let's hope that that pans out. Um, Colin, we'll turn back over to you. Um, you know, so we'll shift a little bit. Uh, we talked about uh, before we walked in here, so what? So what are these AI applications? Who are they intended for? And how do we get from where we are today to a future state? Sure. Um, and for, for some of us, it's been a long journey. I know I've been at this for 25 years, depending on how you're counting. Um, Look, well, and I think it starts with what problems are we trying to solve? Tools will come along and they'll come and go as they have for the past bunch of years and decades. There was an early form of AI back around World War II and then a later form of it. Where is it ultimately going? You have to focus on, well, what problems do you really want to solve? We've heard about diagnostic problems and that's a big, that's a big deal for sure. 
especially earlier diagnosis of, of deadly diseases. There are, of course, workforce automation applications of AI where this is now replacing or, or workers are making them more efficient. My own bias and the type of AI and the, or the problems that we've been focused on solving, because AI is just a tool and data is just a, an input, is really around solving the matching problem. How do we better match health interventions to individual patients to improve outcomes and lower the total cost of care? And whether that's drug interventions, medical procedures, care management, or even the provider network, that, in my mind, is probably the biggest problem facing us and the biggest opportunity. wasted, not because the interventions don't work, but because they're not matched to the right patient at the right time. So along that continuum, where are we in the trajectory of where we're going to? I think we're finally starting to have the data. You know, when we started our company back in 2000, the human genome hadn't been sequenced yet. Right? And then even after it was sequenced, there's only three people who had it sequenced and that was not matched up to clinical data and that wasn't matched up to interventions. So as far as going back to the problem of solving treatment effectiveness, you didn't have the pieces, and it was way too expensive, right? It was a billion dollars, took 10 years. Now we're finally at a stage where I'd say the data fuel, it's not quite there fully, but it's there enough in enough places such that this is starting to work, it's starting to scale, and it's now solving certain problems that humans simply could otherwise not solve. So I think we're in the early innings. Um, of the applications of AI and data to these problems. I think data has been a big limiting factor. Computing power used to be a big limiting factor. Today, we take it for granted, just like we're plugging in uh, into an electrical socket. We take for granted that there's cloud-based supercomputing just there, and it's cheap and it works. It didn't used to be like that. And so, and I think algorithmically, I think the platforms are also getting there. So, so I think we're in, we're approaching the golden era of the applications here, I think in the next three to five years, we're gonna see some big, big um, impact from some of these applications in specific areas. And I think we are going to, back to personalized medicine, I think in, in the not so distant future, we won't be calling it personalized medicine. It will soon be just how we practice medicine. I think it's gonna change the whole reimbursement and payment landscape too, as payers are starting to adopt these approaches more and more a lot of our partners, um, I think in a five to 10 year time frame, we're gonna see a lot of new things. The first AI driven drug, I think we're gonna see treatment and care pathways that are truly personalized. And I actually think it's going to drive a whole new renaissance of precision healthcare that's going to allow us to get much better outcomes and spend less money doing it. Could I just build on that slightly? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, and I, Colin's probably there, but I just wanna be even more specific to what he's saying. Given the amount of capital that's flowed into the topic of this one, cancer, given the number of therapies that work, the real challenge we have is figuring out what works with what for what patient. You could argue, and I would argue, I could be wrong, that most cancers could be at least turned into chronic conditions by the therapies we already have available if we found the patients early enough, we got them on the exact right treatments. As things happen, T-cell exhaustion arose, they mutated away from an antigen, whatever, you were immediately on top of it and you moved them to the right next things and got it done. Um, and so in some sense, you could say for an area like cancer, while I want some more blue sky research, it's maybe the real solution is what Colin just said. Uh, that's what's gonna get us there. Now Alzheimer's, I would say, is a different place, right? Alzheimer's, we need a lot of blue sky research because it's not, so I'm not saying every condition is in this case, but something as dread as cancer, maybe we're at the point where it's less about getting 27 new drugs, although we need some new ones. It, you know, certainly we need the stuff in the pipeline. Um, it's more about how to use them. Yeah. Can I can I expand on that? Yep. You know, I, I think uh, <clears throat> I think the other thing that we're seeing, or I think the opportunity, and I think it was just mentioned, is is um, kind of on the continuum of care, earlier treatment, right? So in terms of catching it early, and looking at the uh, continuum of care of how 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 it's treated, and and I think when you start looking at these types of therapies, uh, like what we do with uh, with focus ultrasound, where we can do these early treatments, uh, of for example lesioning. 
right, is, and we look at things like, for example, movement disorders where we're treating an essential tremor. There's 10 million people that suffer from it or from Parkinson's. And if you can catch the disease early and understand what you're doing and then you follow that patient and you bring the cl clinical information that's relevant to the, to the quality of life and to the patient, then we can get smarter about when to treat and how to treat with these types of, of, of non-invasive types of therapies that we're doing. So I think, I think catching it early, early detection and using types of therapies where you have to have the data and has to be very, very continuous data, it, garbage in, garbage out is, you know, so, so we, have to, we have to make sure that the format is right, we have to understand how we're looking at it, and then catching these things early when the, in the total cost of the healthcare system, the system has to move to try to uh, allow this to happen uh, so that we can, we, can, we can really reduce the amount of money that we're spending on these, these diseases and try to treat them in a chronic and, and an economic way. Great. So we'll turn, um, you know, the, the question will shift to what should the audience get excited about? Where should investors or funders um, be deploying resources? I think sort of the flip side of that, where should they be cautious? Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, even I'm old enough to have seen waves of, oh, get excited about stem cell research, get excited about the Human Genome Project. Um, you know, I don't want this to be another big wave of AI and big data. So. Uh, what should investors or funders be excited about? What should they uh, uh, look out? What are the caution signs they should look out for? Maybe I'll start with you, Mike. Um, well, I'm, it's hard for me to pick out specific uh, things to be excited about. I'll leave that to you guys. But I would think about um, promises, again, of this one, you know, they're going to press a button and all problems are going to be solved. Mm -hmm. There's definitely hype there, right? So you're going to have to peel beneath the layer and decide, is that hype all hype all the way down? Or is there a kernel? So we get pitched, of course, a lot of solutions that are just press this button and it's going to pop out the perfect target. It's going to take all your genomics data. And we think we have more genomics data than anyone in the world. It's going to take all your phenotypic data, every experiment you ever run, put it into a blender and out pops the perfect target. I, I don't think the technology is even close. Do I think it can help? Yeah. Do I think you, it's called the centaur model where you have the human aided by the computation, right? So whether that's uh, natural language processing technologies to allow your researchers to spend less time looking for literature and helping to do the integration and putting together data for them so they can interpret it, running their experiments and helping them interpret it. I think there's a lot it can do, but I would at least say, um, you got to scrape beneath the surface of the push the button, solve all problems, because that's assuredly not where the technologies are at at this point. Uh, doesn't mean there's not a real technology at the kernel of it, but you're just getting the, the hype bubble at that point. Yes. Yeah, and, and we've actually we've already seen that in the field of, of dermatology, where there are hundreds of, of apps available for you to download on iTunes and whatnot. Um, but really, very none of them are validated in the diagnostic realm. So again, the, the safe and friendly apps would be those reminding you to check your birthday suit on your birthday, do a skin exam, uh, perhaps you know store and forward technology that's related to teledermatology or teledermoscopy. But really, the ones that are um, purporting to have diagnostic impact are potentially dangerous. And the FTC fined several app developers a few years ago for uh, false claims that they could diagnose melanoma with even the best algorithm at that point under diagnosing melanoma by 30 percent, which could have incredibly <coughs> adverse consequences for patients. And so um, the apps aren't there yet. It's not a push button ready. It's not ready for a diagnostic impact. We've been very humbled taking ours to the real world setting. There are a lot of issues we, we still have with lighting, zoom, angle, uh, pre-processing segmentation of images, and importantly, bias. And so ruler bias, markers on the person, background, uh, the, the algorithms tend to uh, equate those rulers with the malignant lesion and then give us a malignant probability output. And so we have to really test these to a much better degree and use the ones that are safe. I mean, ideally, we want to develop uh, the ability for this app to be a, a consumer-facing smartphone deployable on the 6.3 billion smartphones that are going to be available and in practice by 2021 that will allow for diagnosis and triage and early diagnosis of skin cancer to save lives from melanoma. But we're not there yet. Great. Uh, well, how would you, what, what should they invest in and be excited about, Colin? I'd put my money <laughs> on applications that are ripe. And by ripe, that means the sufficient data is there at the right level of granularity to solve it, where the AI tools are already there um, 
the right type of AI for that problem and where it really unleashes a lot of clinical benefit and, and economic value. For example, there's all sorts of points in treatment guidelines, points of ambiguity. So you think about NCCN guidelines for cancer. There's so lots of places after you fail first or second line therapy, um, a lot of open questions that are both painful, expensive, and lead to death. Can, can one solve those specific problems with existing data and technologies? Um, and I think Mike brought this point up a number of times. This is not simply technology. This is science, it's clinical science, and therefore one has to bring that level of domain expertise to the table. It is a fable that just uh, you know, a handful of machine learning PhDs at MIT are really gonna solve that much on their own. It just doesn't work like that. In the world of social media, maybe, but not in this more serious, heavy science space that we're in. And you know, on, on Colin's theme there, I mean, just take for example, Imaging, I mean, you hear a lot about the radiologist and, you know, in the next, I have a daughter who's in medical school and, uh, you know, she's saying, Dad, I hear that radiology is not the place to go uh, because in, in 10 years, there's not going to be any radiologists. Uh, well, there's, there's, you know, I think if you, if you look at the, at the, at the, um, at the uh, computer scientists that are developing these algorithms, they would all agree with that. But if you actually look at the clinicians, and try to understand that I think there's a lot more work to be done, and and just the just the, the mere uh, sheer factor of getting through clinical trials and clinical studies to validate all this stuff, and I think you're starting to see it in the dermatology field, as an example, in, in terms of what Susan was mentioning, but in this whole field of imaging, I, I don't think it's going to happen that fast. I, I think I think we've all, I think we're a little ahead of ourselves, and, and you look at um, uh, just the regulatory perspective in terms of the FDA, in terms of how how they respond to this type of stuff and, and, um, and the types of uh, studies that are being, being approved and, and, and you know, I've seen some companies developing it around the stroke area. Uh, it's all promising and it's gonna take a while uh, to come up, but I don't think it's gonna happen, happen overnight, so I would be very cautious. Let me just one, add, oh, sorry, Colin. Okay. I was gonna say one specific I forgot, since you mentioned the FDA, is their use of real world data and the generation of real world evidence in this space because I think we're in an unusual time where the FDA is a lot more open to evidence coming from real world data and that's a lot more plentiful and it's getting to be a much higher quality. So that's, I just wanted to add um, one thing you could do if you're thinking about the investment decision is push on whatever entity, what is the quality of the underlying data? Um, because you know where the techniques are at now, they are very data hungry. Right, so a, so a three-year-old, you can watch your three-year-old, they'll learn what a cat and a dog is maybe on a handful of examples. The machine learning applications tend to require vast quantities of data, and you have to have good data. If you don't have good data, it's gonna be hard to do. Now, as Colin says, there's more good data in the world, but what does this entity bring? Do they have special data that nobody else has? Can they put it together in a way nobody else can put it together? You know, if it's a magic algorithm, maybe, but you have to ask why doesn't Jeff Hinton in the, in the bowels of Google already have that algorithm? Because, you know, do they really outcompete Google on the actual techniques? Um, so, yeah. again, just some thoughts. And also for the visual processing machine learning, it requires defined endpoints. It's a yes, no, it's a binary answer for most of these the machine learning doesn't know what to do with I don't know. And, and medicine's got a lot of I don't know, and it's good to be honest about that. So we have to be very, very careful where that leads us. And, and it's the supervised versus and, unsupervised learning. And AI is not going to have yeah. empathy and compassion and creativity, and we'll always need a human behind the machine learning. Absolutely. And on the, on the, on the vision side, it's like you have to do the correlation of what it means from a clinical outcomes perspective. So, so in defining what those clinical outcomes are and then using that information to go back and, and teach the algorithm to do a better, a better outcome um, is, is something that's not trivial. Um, so we'll turn to uh, one more question. I did want to note we will open it, uh, the floor to the audience for questions in a few minutes. Um, but Colin, I wanted to talk about on the preparatory call we discussed that there are becoming complex and sufficiently dense data sets and the idea of moving from you know, hypothesis-driven research to data-driven research. Do you want to comment on sort of where we're at that, that uh, the understanding of basic biology now is deeper than any one biologist or potentially any one clinician might be able to comprehend in, yep. in one patient. Yeah. So I think maybe taking a step back, what, what was the goal of all this, right? What was the point of collecting the data? What was the point of developing the algorithms? 
I think the big holy grail point of a lot of this is we want to be able to eventually reverse engineer human biology, the human patient on the computer, and many human patients on the computer in a similar way that happens in other industries, right? Because when you reverse engineer said in silico human, you can now simulate the what if counterfactuals. What if I treat the patient with that drug versus that drug, that care pathway versus this other one? What's going to work for this patient instead of standard of care that's treating patients as hypothetical average patients to try this, come back when that doesn't work, try that. Can this industry get to the point of leveraging this data to do what Airbus or Boeing does, which is to simulate their product on the computer under many different conditions of wind shear, temperature, design, before a plane's ever built? Can we get to the point with sufficiently rich data, powerful computing, and the right AI platforms that can now reverse engineer these models mechanistically. And this is where the causal machine learning and simulation comes in. They go together. You still don't hear that much about Bayesian network inference and causal modeling and, and AI. But, <laughs> but yes, yes it's, uh, it's, 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 it's A is coming because it's the really powerful form to answer the questions that we've always wanted to answer. We just didn't have the data or the tools to do it in the past. So I'm very bullish on where the field is going. It was limited by data for a long time and by computing power for a long time. But I think people, most people in the industry underestimate the power of what happens when these things come together because you really want to be able to run many millions of clinical trials in silico instead of a three and four year patient recruitment and treatment cycle, super expensive experiments and you often turn over you open the envelope and oftentimes it doesn't come up in the way you want and we don't really know why. Can we get to this point? I think we can. It's a, it's a, it's a very ambitious and crazy concept, but it's not that crazy anymore. Yeah, so how do we move the field forward, Mike? How do we, how do we make enough evidence that you'd be excited by? Uh, I think it, it is putting all these data sets together. I'm very excited about the possibility that we're seeing now to put large amounts of um, uh, electronic medical records together with large amounts of omics data, genomics, proteomics, on the same, on the same people, together with uh, much thinner but longitudinal data from wearables and other tracking devices. Because today, if you go to the doctor, you have heart failure, they'll put you through a six-minute walk test. How far can you walk in six minutes? And that tells you a lot. We have beautiful curves that will tell you how you're doing based on that. I suspect there are even more beautiful curves you could construct if you watch that patient and everything she did all day long, getting up, how far she walked, did she go up any steps, et cetera, what her respiration was, heart rate, et cetera. Um, so I think if you start to bring these large data sets together, that's where we're headed. It's harder than it looks. You get EMR data, it's dirty, it has mistakes, it has things that can't possibly be right. Um, but, you know, I think we can work through that. And so for me, it's putting that together. That's step one. Step two is the imagination of people to really think of the use cases. And again, start with use cases that really make sense, not pie in the sky, we're gonna solve every problem, but really thought this through, if we do it this way, it'll work, and then you've gotta sign up for the change management, yep. and it's not trivial. Yep. Um, so you, you brought up one interesting point about longitudinal you know, mapping. So Susan, I, I think of uh, the things you've worked on in dermatology that w a one time, once in time snapshot of a skin lesion isn't sufficient, but so the longitudinal aspect is probably critical. How do you move uh, the dermatology work you're doing forward, and who will be the first user, the dermatologist, the primary care doc? Probably the dermatologist. I mean, right now we have a couple of apps that are quite useful. Mole Mapper, University of Michigan's got an app, but they are designed to have the patient take a picture of the lesion and then re-image the lesion in a month or three months or six months. But again, that's going to take a lot of um, initiative from the patient, which we really can't rely on. So what we're thinking about are different care delivery models where you know, in the rural areas, the, the individual is being photographed in a standard fashion by a trained individual who can capture the image. We can use a multitude of non-invasive imaging technologies, of which uh, there are several that are quite promising. Some are FDA approved, many on the horizon. Uh, confocal microscopy is one. We use, we use this in conjunction with dermoscopy and, and clinical imaging. These images are then relayed via telederm and teledermoscopy to the expert dermatologist, often with an AI component to read them. 
and then the dermatologist can uh, decide on, on the lesion's malignant potential and, and expedite that care into a procedural or access clinic. But um, it is, um, you know, I think it's where we're headed, but again, it's not, it's not going to be uh, as easy as we hoped, and I, I think that the care delivery models are going to require a lot of infrastructure change, a lot of support, as, as Mike has alluded to. Great. And uh, Maurice, where do you, where do you uh, advise and how we can move this field forward? What, what do you think are the next steps? Well, you know, I, I think from a from a macro level, I, I think that we as a as a system um, have to be prepared and ready uh, for these types of changes. And I'm not sure we are. I think we're fighting a certain immune system in terms of the delivery system, how how we're providing care in general. Um, you know, you hear a lot of good talks, a lot of good thinking about it, but it's actually kind of seeing it actually move is, is going to be kind of the, the question that's to me is going to be concerning is 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 you know for example uh, if you if you look at the uh, at the just the general uh, fee for service models that we have and and um, we've got to shift into the, the payer models and understand these payer models in terms of what's driving and motivating people um, look at the way that uh, we're collecting data you know we talk about this these these big uh, systems that are being built, but you know a lot of them are very monopolized, where they cost you know, uh, uh, you know Mayo Clinic will spend two billion dollars on a, an IT infrastructure that's kind of a closed system, and and what type of what type of uh, conformity are we really thinking about? You know it, it's easy to take money out of Bangkok. How easy is it to get your medical records on anybody? Uh, kind of the transparency of all these type of things, um, and and. Clearly, you know, in a conference like this, you know, and you're hearing a lot of the right people saying the right thing at all levels, whether it's the government, whether it's in the in the uh, the provider side, and everybody wants to move in, in that direction. But th these are very, very heroic efforts to kind of push this through, and there's a lot of forces that are kind of opposed to it, and and I think that the you know in in that I I, I think that we should continue that theme and and, and it and. And I think we need to kind of look at the at the baby steps of things that are that are basically in front of us and simple, and start showing examples of how this works. And I, and, and that's just going to take time. It's, it's, I don't think it's going to happen in five years or ten years. I think it's going to take twenty plus years to kind of get that right. It's it's somewhat of a democratization of of information and 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 being able to adapt it into a a, a very complicated healthcare system that is very convoluted and. and I think it's a combination of, of the pressures that are being put uh, with the technology companies kind of coming in and really questioning how things are being done. So it's going to be a transformation in terms of that. But it, that's not going to be enough. It's, it's going to be the, this is a much more complicated process than, than doing an Airbnb or doing, a, or doing an Uber uh, in terms of the type of information, the type of data, and, 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 and what it means and the implications, the complexity of these types of questions about having information out there. Who has it? Who's handling that information? What are the safety elements of it? You know, do, do we have to incorporate blockchain into this type of conversation? And, and, um, and, and, and just knowing that somebody has a, a precondition and, and that information gets out to the insurance companies, how is that going to be, how is that going to impact someone's life? And how, and, and in today's world, in terms of just the simple things, I don't even know if it's that simple, but the type of things in social media that we're dealing with, in terms of understanding that data, and the threats that we have about data, and how that data is being collected, I think these are all very, kind of very complex um, areas, and, and I think it's like trying to focus on the simple solutions of just showing some examples, I think, can kind of create the pathway. Great. So I think we'll open it up to the audience with more questions. There's a microphone that we brought to you. Uh, so why don't we start in the back? Uh, yeah, you, uh, right there. To me, the elephant in the room, uh, thanks so much for the panel, but, but an elephant, at least a, a, an elephant, rather than the elephant in the room, AI and machine learning inherently are technology-based discussions, and this is a healthcare panel. So f for, from my perspective, the elephant in the room, I'd love your perspective on it, is how do you see your world changing with the technology companies starting to really lead in venture capital investments in healthcare ventures, and with unlimited CapEx dollars, uh, and inherently focus on AI and machine learning and the very fabric of what they do, 
I'd love to hear from each of you in your own perspective, five or 10 years out, how do you expect the landscape to change, evolve, and how do each of your organizations contemplate and think about that, uh, both in the public and the private sector alike? Thanks, sir. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say we just formed a new center for AI at Stanford, and I think that the interface, the interaction between the clinicians, the investigators, computer scientists, artificial intelligence experts is going to help us solve those dilemmas and, and really make this elephant in the room less scary because the, the computer science and AI side wants that consumer-facing app, wants that deliverable out there. And we have to pull back and do this in a measured, regulated fashion once we've done the prospective validation studies. That being said, the imaging technologies are booming, including state-of-the-art two-dimensional, three-dimensional imaging in which we can tie AI and several other ways to image lesions and on all of the other specialties that have a lot of visual recognition and pattern recognition. So um, I don't think there's a simple answer to that, but I think from my perspective, our field will be revolutionized because it is a, a largely pattern recognition, visual recognition. A lot of the automated tasks can be taken away from the clinician, hopefully to enhance the relationship between the physician and the patient, to improve the medical care and to save lives, particularly reaching out to more rural areas where there are sca scarce specialists. Uh, I mean, you know, if we're talking a 10 year plus time frame, I think it's gonna be pretty revolutionary across a number of areas. I think we've discussed a lot of those areas. Uh, but, you know, I see it becoming more of a partnership, right? What I see the, the, at least the larger tech companies doing is moving in, obviously, into cloud computing, and they're building beautiful workbenches with every AI tool you could possibly imagine on top of it. You can get it from Amazon, you can get it from Google, you, you know, Azure, everybody will do it for you. And what they really want is us to put their data there, give them a lot of money to hold the data, and then help us do things. I think where they are trying to go directly into healthcare, it is harder. It is regulated. It's not Airbnb or Uber. If you irritate um, the taxi and limousine service of New York, they send you a strongly worded letter. If you violate FDA regulations, they send men with guns and take you to jail. And it doesn't matter how much capital you have. It doesn't matter how much tech you have. So I see it more as uh, we will end up working with them. I don't think they're going to get into wet labs anytime soon. I don't think they're going to do those things. And I hope that in working with them, we can solve some of the problems we talked about, and I think they will have profound impact, but I don't see it so much as uh, they're going to come in from the side and completely disrupt everything, and it's because of the regulatory structure and the fact that lives are on the line. Um, and I think society's tired of the move fast, break it, and then, you know, we'll let somebody else fix it mentality. I just don't think that's going to work. Yeah, you know, but, but on the other hand, I, on the other hand, I mean, how much longer can we live with 18% of GDP going to healthcare? I mean, it, it's just... It's just from an economic standpoint, it doesn't make sense. And there's so much inefficiencies in the system. And I think it's going to take, and it will take a lot of capital and a lot of cash. And I think that, that the right conversations and the right actions are happening. Dollars are being spent in a meaningful way that wasn't there 10 years ago. And I think that it's going to be in those drug, disco the drug discoveries, trying to create these cancers that are, that are, that are killers that are into, into chronic diseases, converting them, using technologies like ours in terms of being able to, to treat, treat in, in, a, in a palliative way instead of waiting for the disease to get bad. All these type of things are all going to start come. And, and at the end of the day, it's, I think the driver, the motivation is the inefficiencies and the continuous um, use of GDP as 20% is not sustainable, especially when you look at the, the types of debt that we're starting to incur as a, com as a country. And, and, and that in combination, right now we're all in a boom. You know, the stock market hits another all-time high. You know, it's like how many more years of this is going to happen? There's going to be a fall here. And all of a sudden, that fall is going to go right into health care. It's going to go into pension fund, understanding all these type of things. And thank God, thank God that that elephant is in the room. And thank God that we have technology raising its flag and putting big dollars to work, because that's what it's going to take. Yeah. So I would say there's been a lot more hype around what the big tech companies are going to do in this space than reality. And that's, I think, absolutely true in the short term. In the longer term, um, I do expect that they're going to have some real impact, but as you heard uh, earlier on the panel, um, it is going to be in partnership. This is different than um, this is different than consumer advertising. It's different than a lot of other areas where there's a real bar for domain knowledge before you can be credible in the space. And so I think we're going to keep hearing about a lot of noise from the tech companies, 
And they're going to focus on areas where they can win, but I don't see them making drugs directly anytime soon uh, no, or, or health plans anytime soon. But they're, gonna, they're a force to be reckoned with, but I wouldn't underestimate, um, you, I think, the, the, the barrier to, to true entry in the space. We probably have more threat, we're at more threat than probably other people on the stage here as a tech company in this space. But we're not, we're not, we're not worried about that kind of competition. Once again, it's more, uh, I think, at the end of the day, collaborative, and they would probably try to buy us before they would attempt to replicate but Colin, I would argue we need we need creativity. Right. We need new ideas, new solutions. And I think the old guard of how we've been doing this needs to be threatened. And I think that's what we're seeing here. I think we're all of a sudden starting to see a real threat. And and you know, if it, I don't care who solves the problem, it doesn't matter, but at the end of the day everyone's upping their game. That's fine, I, I but I just agree. I think we have to say, do we think it's gonna go down like Airbnb and Uber? I do not. No. This is a massively more complicated system with interlocking incentives. It, you know, following LA or Udowski, I would call this a Pareto non-optimal. Nash equilibrium means nothing moves because everybody's incentives are locked in. So the casually come in from the side and break stuff, I just don't see happening. We'll yep. see. We'll, we'll see what happens. I think there can be real positive benefits from tech being involved. Huge dollars, $2 trillion industry in the U.S. alone, and they want their piece of it. And I think they're going to get their piece of it. But I think if we rely on them just coming and break stuff and somehow that's going to fix it, I, I don't see yeah. it. I, I, I consider myself a hybrid. We yeah. are a technology yeah. company. Yeah. I've been doing this for 20 years, and yeah. it's, it takes time. Well, excellent question. Uh, next question. When, when, I'm not sure if uh, when I think about the last seven years of this decade, or the first seven years, and the hype of AI, and medicine, I think of IBM Watson. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think of Amgen having a partnership with IBM Watson in 2011. Maybe there was something signed on biosimilars. Oh, maybe. I, I don't think know. Before about Mike I, got there. That I think of uh, IBM Watson being uh, signed with many cancer centers. It's true. Clearly, one of the lessons learned is don't fall for all the hype. But I'm curious if there are other practical lessons to be learned from the sensationalized kind of well, everything I'll that was I'll promised. take that since you pointed to Amgen. <laughs> Look, I think you've got to be careful of the totalizing vision. This idea that we're in an era where somebody can come in and solve all your problems, whether that's because they have the magic button or because they have a system with hundreds of people they're going to deploy and solve all problems. I just don't think technology, you know, we work with Colin quite closely and his team, but we spend hours looking at like can we can can the technology work on this very specific problem and then we try to solve that very specific problem not uh, this fantasy that again you're just going to go out and press a button and it's going to happen we spent a couple hours this morning on well would this problem fall with this problem could you get at this could this could the technology work here i just don't think we're anywhere close to this again whether it's deploying hundreds of people and a giant computer that is in somewhere you've never seen or a magic button we're just not there and we haven't really talked about the implementation either. I mean, the social determinants of disease and how we're reaching out to the underserved and, and really trying to make differences in morbidity and mortality in vast swaths of the population that may not be very tech savvy or have access to the technology. And I think, again, that's part of the infrastructure and, and the modeling of where we see AI in the future. Critical. Uh, yes, next question. Two quick questions, uh, one to Colin and one to Susan. Colin, uh, when and if do you see um, clinical recommendations being based and implemented based on AI uh, uh, analytics, w bypassing the need for uh, prospective randomized studies? So would you see that coming in the next five to 10 years as you yeah. uh, expected? Yeah. And uh, a yeah. small, by question, uh, small question on yeah. the side of that, how confident are you that the value added is due to the AI and that simple or simpler, more simple uh, uh, mathematical tools like any regression uh, models would do the w a similar yeah. work. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I was going to give one answer until you said the last bit of the, of, of the question. So um, we have deployed, we have applications deployed right now uh, within several health insurance companies across multiple states that are driving the care recommendations. So this is not 
fantasy, it's reality across many hundreds of thousands of Medicare Advantage and other, and other commercial uh, members in the US. So that's, um, so that part's already there. The, other, the specific thing you said at the end of that sentence was when does that start to replace or, um, or complement randomized controlled trials? It's a great question. Uh, and I'd say that that's coming. I think in the next, I think we're on the precipice of it. I think in the next 18, 24 months to a few years, you're going to see, along with randomized controlled trials, you're going to see real world evidence, uh, uh, you know, packages being generated to better understand how the patients are going to respond. How should the clinical trials be designed? And that's going to drive the labeling. It's going to drive uh, impact approvals. So I think we're almost right there. And some of the, the, the companies in the real world data space like Flatiron Health and, 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 and others are helping to fuel that transition. So I think, it's, I think it's a great question and I think we're... It is happening. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing the first, I mean, packages have gotten in, not so much for new drugs that have never touched a patient, that's harder, but for drugs that are already out there to extend into new indications or to update where they can be used, where there is a large body of data out there in the world, and then folks like Colin can go to work on that data and ask what does it mean and what happens if we intervened. Um, it, it, it's coming. But we have seen conflicting evidence, uh, for example, on cardio protection in, among diabetic patients uh, uh, when they, those were derived from real world evidence and prospective data, like the DECLARE uh, trial. So. Yeah. Yeah, we have to be careful, right? I mean, yeah. that's, that's why I would say, as much as I'm excited about the convolutional neural networks and the machine vision and things like that, I think if you look at the kinds of stuff that we're talking about that Colin does, uh, and if you're interested, you could read Jutea Pearl's new book, The Book of Why, it goes in quite depth. It gives you a rigorous way to ask those questions, and it really matters how the questions are asked and what techniques you bring to bear, because you can it's garbage in, garbage out kind of stuff. But I think it's, it would be a mistake to say it's only randomized clinical trials. That's the only way to get at truth in the world. Susan, w one or two words about, uh, about your <coughs> algorithm and, uh, and specificity and negative predictive value, and relating to that, how does that change the workflow? I mean. Are you going to use it so that uh, patients are not being referred to you as a specialist? Are you expecting a high NPV? I would hope that we can test it and validate it prospectively through multi-center studies, which is what we have planned once we perfect the app that we've created um, in clinical world to actually allow us to obviate the need to refer a patient based on the high sensitivity and specificity of the AI of the of the probability output. Um, our our algorithm has not done as well with inflammatory diseases. It does better with neoplastic diseases, so malignant or benign in various cancers. It has not been tested uh, across the disease spectrum. It's been trained across the disease spectrum, but not tested in, in the real world setting, or even with the test that we did for our publication in Nature two years ago. So I would like to think that we will develop, and I think this is being done worldwide, uh, the, the kind of probability output or score or diagnosis that would reduce the need for the specialty referral because we trust that result, and then that could improve workflow. On the other hand, reaching that person who needs that diagnosis in a rural area, getting them into you know, an access or procedural clinic setting quickly could make all the difference. But again, right now, we're, we're not there yet. Great, any other questions from the audience? Hi, thank you, this is a very interesting panel. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the, the emerging algorithms and technological pieces that will drive better uh, machine learning and decision making. And there seems to be a return to the question of how do, you, how do you capture a large enough and diverse enough pool of data in a timely fashion to put into the system to make sure that the results are getting more and more accurate over time. And what I'm not hearing <coughs> is whether or not there are any innovations emerging on how to capture more of that data in, in, in a more real-time capacity. Yeah. So. One answer is you have to go beyond randomized controlled trials because that's 
too small, it's too precious, um, and it's too expensive. And so it is using real world data to get there. I don't know that it really needs like a lot of like massive new innovation and invention. The data, this is data exhaust that's coming off of our healthcare system. We just didn't collect it very well in the past. So the American Recovery Act sped up the adoption of electronic health records. Several years after that, it created a new derivative asset of a lot more electronic healthcare records and related data, but still that wasn't enough. It then took major investment in the curation and annotation of that data to make it clinical grade. So if you say, well, what's the innovation of some of these companies like Flatiron or Coda or Tempest, uh, and I think where you get at some of the differences have to do with, well, how rigorous are you getting at the endpoints? But a lot of that wasn't really technological innovation. It was a lot of work and a lot of people. Um, I'm not sure how many, Flatiron had hundreds of people nurses, clinicians employed annotating the electronic health record data. I think a number of the companies start with NLP. They start with thinking AI will do it. And then they have to go back to the old fashioned way. But I would say that's some of the, that's some of what's giving us the diversity and size of data. What is I think the big interesting thing that's coming is when that type of longitudinal clinical data starts to be married with high throughput molecular data. That's gonna be one of the biggest transformations we're gonna see in medicine and healthcare. And it's now coming. We, you know, we all expected it to be there sooner. For lots of reasons it wasn't there. It's now coming. And so in two, three, four, five years, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be transformative. Great. So I think we're out of time, but with that, let's thank the panelists for all their efforts today. And thank you all for joining. <laughs>